Welcome to 12 Steps to Your Success, brought to you by the Fremont Group. Thank you for taking the time to explore the possibilities and potential of your own business and acquaint yourself with the Fremont Group. As a thank you gift for your time, the Fremont Group will be sending you a free copy of Minding My Own Business. The details will follow. So let's get started. Welcome, my name is Dirk Dieters. I am the founder, executive director, and currently a success partner with the Fremont Group. The Fremont Group is a nonprofit organization supporting small business owners for the past 20 years. DFG provides mentoring, coaching, and consulting to small business owners. We work with you, get to know you, understand your goals, and then take you by the hand and focus you on accomplishing those. We also have an accounting division, our accounting services for small businesses, where we will actually become your in-house bookkeeper done remotely. And then thirdly, we also provide webinars, including the Minding My Own Business workshop series and significantly significant other uh, educational materials uh, on our blog. The Minding My Own Business Workshop is a separate entity in itself where uh, it's approximately an hour, hour and a half long, uh, and it's done as a workshop uh, for small groups or individuals. Uh, you can register for those on our website. And it, they're all based upon the book, Minding My Own Business, where you follow the six responsibilities of the small business owners, as the blog also follows throughout the course of the year. The 12 Steps to Success. In this webinar, we will be covering the 12 steps that are required for you to obtain your success. Each step is thought provoking and will provide insight into your own business. You will also become familiar with the Fremont Group, our approach, and, and have an introduction to our Mining Own Business workshops and webinars. Again, each step is a concept of its own. You must understand that concept before you continue to the following step. So take your time and think and sometimes actually do some of the exercises we recommend and you will then proceed to the following step. If you follow these 12 steps, your business will change and we will guarantee you that it will increase the likelihood of you obtain, obtaining your success. Step one, understand our philosophy and mostly understand yourself. What do we mean by understand yourself? Well, all of our work and this webinar are designed to increase the chances of you obtaining success. But what is success? What is the success that you're really trying to achieve? And we tie an owner down and they say, oh, we want to earn more money or I want to have a boat or I want to have more time or something like that. But then you have to keep peeling back the onion and go a little bit deeper and say, okay, why do you want that? What is really motivating you to come here each day? What is it that you truly want? I think one very insightful answer we got from a business owner was uh, when we finally got down to it, what he admitted was that uh, the reason he's doing it and the reason his success is to show his spouse that he really could do this and that he wasn't a bozo and uh, that he really could support a family in a, uh, a very uh, comfortable manner uh, from the, his efforts of running his business. And he wanted to prove that to his spouse. Once he got to that point, a lot of things fall in place. So the first exercise I would suggest for you is to do just that. Write down on a sheet of paper somewhere, why are we doing this? What is it that really, really motivates you? And after you've written it down, be sure you ask yourself, well, why do I want that? Why do I want that? Dig as deep as you can, cross it out and put down the deeper meaning. When you understand why you're doing it, you'll understand yourself much better. Our philosophy goes along with this and 
pushes you towards that success. Our first tenet is that everyone is doing exactly what they want to do. And this applies to owners and employees. You are doing exactly what you want to do. If all you really want to do is come in each day and uh, keep the accounting and uh, try to collect some money and see if you can sell this or see if you can get this job done or that job done uh, and basically do the job of a manager or a general manager, if that's all you want to do, that's all you're going to do. But you're not going to own a business. You're going to own a job. Employees are the same way. Each one of them is doing exactly what they want to do. We'll be covering this later on, but uh, uh, you can use this to your advantage because if you know what it is they want to do, you have sometimes you have to change that behavior. So you have to hold them accountable and you have to create incentives uh, for them uh, to change that behavior. But what is the difference between owning a job and owning a business? Owning a job, as I said, is simply working in a different chair uh, than you were before. A, a first test is this. If you replaced yourself with a person, a manager, whoever, and you had to pay them the proper compensation for doing what you're doing all day long, is your compensation then as from the profit of that business greater than what you're doing now? Or are you really only being compensated for a job? I would suggest that if you only own a job, you're probably working way too many hours, not making enough money and working for a idiot because he doesn't know how to run or she doesn't know how to run the business. You're the one that should be running the business and you should be compensated from the profit of the business. If you don't want to own a business, if all you want to do is own a job, you should probably leave this webinar right now. You won't benefit from it. And we wouldn't take you on as a client because we only work with people who really want it, who really want to own a business, want to build a business and obtain that real success that they have identified for themselves. The Fremont Group uses what we call success partners. I have one, we have a half dozen others. Our success partners are people who have been there and done that. And we work with one model. And that is, you only have what you give. It's by giving of yourself that you grow rich. The Fremont Group is a nonprofit organization. Our fees are entirely different than the for-profit consulting companies that you probably run across. The bottom line is, obviously, we have to cover our expenses and cover uh, our costs. Uh, but we're trying to make you successful. And that is what our success is. Lastly, you have to look at why does your business exist at all? We have a theory that says this, there is only one reason why your business exists, and that is to make your life better. Your business only exists to make your life better. So, Here's a second exercise for you. Take your sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle at the top on the left side, put better and the top on the right side, put worse and list three to four ways on the left side that this business is making your life better. And then on the right side, list three or four ways that this business is making your life worse. I promise you, if you work with us, you're going to be doing this because frankly, that tells you what needs to be done. You want to get rid of the stuff on the right and build on the stuff on the left. This isn't rocket scientist work, but those are the things that are in the way of you obtaining your success. So I've given you two exercises there. You can pause for a minute and do them, take a note, or you can go on. Our goal today and our goal in the future, if we would work with you, is to assist you in accomplishing your success. So take that time and really dig into yourself and understand why are you doing this? It may be one of the best things that you can do.
Okay, let's move on to step two. Business owners are different. If you haven't figured that one out. You are not the same as your employees. There are three kinds of people in working in businesses. There are technical people, managerial people, and entrepreneurial people. And a business needs all three of those. Let's define them a little bit. First of all, the technical person. The technical person is just simply the person who likes doing his job. He likes doing the function that they've been assigned with. Now, it can be a very high level. It could be uh, writing legal briefs. It could be uh, uh, doing uh, tax returns. It could be, or it could be the other end of the spectrum. It could be just cleaning up the the, the hallway or whatever. I mean, I, I, but they they simply enjoy doing the, their tasks, and they uh, they probably do it fairly well. Um, but that's what where they get their self satisfaction. Their self-worth comes from just simply doing their job. They're probably getting their, their real reinforcing self-worth somewhere else. Uh, maybe it's from little league or coaching or uh, maybe it's their, their church or their kids or family or whatever it is. They probably get their, their uh, real psychic reinforcement outside of their work. They're not getting it from their work. They just like doing their job and that's fine. We need technical people. We also need managerial people, which are the second type of people. The managerial mindset likes to create reports, likes to create systems, likes to figure out how things are done, likes to put things in order, likes to figure those kinds of things out. There's a natural conflict between the managerial mind and the technical mind. The, the technical mind just likes doing their job. And now this managerial person is making them fill out a report, making them uh, keep track of this, making them do the, you know, uh, complete this or, or file this or whatever, um, so that the managerial person can come up with the data that they want. Well, that's a natural conflict between the two. And we need to recognize that uh, conflict. Uh, but you do need, again, both. The third type of person that you need is the entrepreneurial person. The entrepreneurial person is most likely, most likely, but not always, uh, the owner of the company, the boss, okay? Um, quite often, they are ADD. They're the idea guy. They keep jumping from one thing to the next. Oh, we're gonna do this, now we're gonna do that. And frankly, um, successful businesses require a significant amount of that because if it, there's, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The corollary is, if it's broke, fix it. And the entrepreneurial mind will have very little uh, compassion or for uh, just keeping on and doing it the wrong way. They want to change it. They want to change it and make it better. We're going to take in a new product. We're going to go in a new direction. We're going to open another place. We're going to do another thing. Whatever it might be, they keep moving from one place to another. Now, if you are a managerial person, and you like structure and you like creating reports and you like creating those kinds of things, the managerial person is driven crazy by the entrepreneurial person because the entrepreneurial person keeps changing the rules. The managerial person gets it all figured out and gets these nice uh, uh, reports and systems in place and then the entrepreneurial changes the rules. It's frustrating. You need to understand that conflict also. As to the technical person and the entrepreneurial person, well, they probably just figure, you know what, I'll let him do what he wants. We think he's kind of crazy, but my paychecks are clearing and I'm able to do my job, so it doesn't really matter. And uh, understand that also. Now, we, you have to have all three. Some people have, as a matter of fact, most people have more than one of those traits. They're not purely one or another. But it's, un it's important to understand the differences in the mindsets of the different types of employees that you have. Where the Fremont Group comes in is we work with the owners of companies only. And working with owners of companies means we quite often are working with that ADD person, that person that's jumping from one thing to another. And the most important thing that we can provide is focus. Focus, focus, focus. We can hold the entrepreneurial owner 
accountable for something, for completing something. They have these great ideas, but they're never finished. You need a third party to look at them and keep you focused on how you're trying to do it and what's what, and if it's been accomplished and, and not move on to that next thing until this one is done. That's the kind of benefit that can be added in the mentoring and coaching of the entrepreneurial mind. Now, your three types of employees also. You have the three types of people, there's also three types of employees. We call them climbers, campers, and quitters. The climber in any, almost any, this is pretty true in almost any organization. The climber will represent somewhere between 10 and 20% of your uh, entire workforce. Now, even though they only represent 10 or 20% of your entire workforce, they actually will produce about 80% of your profit. And you know who they are. Look around your business. You, you can see who they are. There's, there's climbers out there and they are the people that really make a difference in your company. Then you have campers. Again, the camper is not a person who gets their real uh, uh, self, provides their self-worth from their job. It's probably from outside. Uh, they would tend to be more likely technical people. Um, and uh, they just do their jobs and they do it well. Uh, and, and you can motivate them, but it, you motivate them differently than you motivate a climber. Uh, you need the campers because uh, just like in a, a sporting team, you can't have an all-star team. You don't want an all-star team. Uh, you need somebody that will pass them the ball and let somebody else score. Um, but the campers are required. You've got to have a certain uh, uh, number of people just to be able to produce uh, uh, the amount of volume of work and stuff that has to be done. And so you can motivate them. You can get it, get uh, the most out of them to make them maybe a high level camper, but they're never going to be a climber. That's simply not who they are. And then the, th they, and the campers will make up about 10 or well, about 70, 80% of your workforce. And even though there's that much, they'll only be producing about 30% of your profit. Then you have the quitters. Depending how good your organization is, everybody has some, somebody out there and uh, uh, they, uh, they may be only be 5 or 10% of your workforce, but uh, they actually cost you 10% of your profit. So let's take a look at growth, uh, excuse me, at turnover. Um, obviously we want, every company is going to have turnover. And we want to focus that turnover in our quitters and our low-level campers. It's, it's uh, completely natural. If you look at how many people you had uh, five years ago and how many you have now, um, there's turnover. There's always turnover. But we want to focus that turnover in your quitters and your low-level campers with, and then have a recruitment plan in place uh, that uh, will consistently replace them and maybe find a few more climbers or high-level campers to replace them with. The other thing that's important to realize is that you, you can't allow turnover in your climbers. Climbers are motivated with a ladder. Climbers are motivated people that want some place to climb. They want to go somewhere. They want to feel like there's opportunity in your organization to go somewhere. And if they don't feel there's that type of opportunity in your or in your organization, they will go across the street for less money if they feel like that there's more opportunity there. And so that is why you have to have growth. You have to have growth within your business or you will not be able to provide climbers with the kinds of opportunities that they need for you to be able to keep them. And when you start having turnover in your climbers, you've created a death spiral. You're not going to survive because those are the people that really produce your money. So in looking back at it, identify people who are either technical, managerial, and entrepreneurial and be sensitive to the conflicts that that exist between them, but then also identify your climbers, your campers, and quitters, and you don't treat them all the same. You don't want 
you, you want to incentivize and, and retain climbers almost no matter what. But as far as the low-level campers and quitters, frankly, you want them to choose to leave so you can replace them. Step three, let's understand what it is that you own. You're a business owner, so what do you own? Well, you don't own the people. Uh, we, 1865 did away with slavery. Uh, you probably don't own a lot of the assets. The bank probably, in effect, really does. What is it that you really own? What is your business? You learned earlier that the reason that business exists is to make your life better. Well, what is that business? The business is a system. You own a system that converts market demand into cash. It converts market demand for your goods and products or services into cash at the end. In a quantitative analysis of functionality, which uh, our success partners will often uh, accomplish, you examine all of the tasks that have to be done to take you from that market demand to cash in the bank. And it will fall into three categories. Getting the work in, getting the work out, and keeping track of it. That's what all businesses do. And your system is how you move through that continuum of getting the work in, getting the work out, and keeping track of it. It's overseen with a management system. How you manage and run your business. That is the major limitation on most businesses. So we define how you get from A to B, and then within it, there are numbers of subsystems. You would have, for example, a sales system. How do you go about getting the work in? What are the tasks and the functions in there that you uh, have to do uh, to get the work in? And sales is a system. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, called The Goal, written quite a while ago, uh, that talks and compares uh, a sales system to a manufacturing system. And uh, uh, it was actually the... Uh, impetus for uh, my book, Minding My Own Business, also. But and you can, there is a system, and you have to understand that it is the system that generates the sales, not individual people. If individual people are doing it, then you can be held hostage by those people. You have to have a sales system where the system produces your results. Once you have the work in, you have to have a way of getting the work out your operational system. How do we operate? How do we do this? And, and obviously there's thousands of uh, combinations and permutations uh, uh, depending on the type of business you do and how big you're on and on and on and on. And on. Um, but uh, what is the system and what are the steps that have to be done to get the work out? And then, of course, an administrative system. Uh, how do we keep track of stuff? What are our compliances? How do we uh, uh, manage for our taxes? How do we produce information? All that sort of stuff. Within that, there's a couple other small uh, subsystems, so to speak. One is your communication system. How do you communicate to your employees? Um, it's like a, a football team in a way. Um, before uh, every season, the coach gets everybody out and says, okay, here's where we're trying to go this year. We're going to get to the Super Bowl. We're going to blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're going to win 15 games, blah, blah, blah. And here's how we're going to plan to do it. Okay. Then every week they have to play a game. So they have a game plan. So what is our game plan for this week? How, how are we going to accomplish it? What has to be done? And then before every play, they have a huddle and they get together and they make sure that even though uh, they've already decided a long time ago what they're going to do on third and short every time uh, uh, they have to review it, make sure everybody's on the same play and then go out play page and then go out and run the play. So what is your communication system? How do you handle the, the long-term 
uh, overview uh, communications to your employees? How do you handle that? Intermediate, uh, what's going to be done this week, this month, whatever it might be uh, that uh, can keep get them focused? And then how do you handle daily huddles uh, to keep them focused and to keep them directed and uh, uh, to accomplish things? That's a communication system. And you'll see later on when we talk about delegation uh, that it's very important that they understand and, ha and ha under what do they need to know in order to do their job. And then lastly, you have to have a financial control system. How do we keep track of our money from cash flows perspective? And how do we keep track of it from a budgeting perspective to make sure we're on track to earn the profit that we have to have? So uh, how, are, how are we handling those financial controls? Typically in every business, every business owner needs to have three meetings a week. And, um, anything over 45 minutes isn't a meeting, it's a uh, therapy session. Uh, and so don't get too concerned when I say that. But you have to have a meeting every week to review your sales. Where do we stand? Are we on track? Where are we going? What has to be done to change it? You also have to have a meeting each week operationally to make sure that the operational issues are being addressed and if there's anything that needs to be done and changed there, it can be dealt with. And then uh, uh, it can be reinforced in the, the daily huddles. And then lastly, you need a financial meeting every week. Where do we stand on our cash flow? Are we on budget? What are the other key profit indicators we want to be uh, always uh, reviewing? And again, it's just to maintain the focus that uh, ADD entrepreneurial uh, business owners generally require. Now, all of that put together is your management system. That is how you control and how you control all of those systems is your management system. But there is one major risk and, and that risk is in that management system because the way you do things will limit your growth and your size. The risk, again, without growth, is losing your climbers. So the risk that you have to address is your comfort zone. What is it you are comfortable doing? And if you're only going to do it that way and you're only going to manage that way, uh, you are never going to obtain the real success that you're looking for. Step four, believe in yourself. You're good. You really are. Uh, you've been around this long. What is it? Uh, the numbers, and I'm sure I'm not exactly right, but it's something along the lines of 70% of all businesses fail in the first year. And of those that survive, 70% of those go out of business in the first five years. And you may have been in business significantly longer than that. So you are way, way ahead of the curve and you are very, very good. So believe in yourself. Why do I say that? I say that because every day you come into the office, you come into the business, and there's something you're trying to do, and you do it. You may be trying to uh, collect some money. You may be trying to make some more sales. You may be trying to clean up some paperwork. You may be trying to meet with somebody. You may be trying to solve an employee problem. Whatever it is you're trying to do, you're accomplishing it, and you're accomplishing what it is that you try to do. However, what many people overlook and you're going to die when I say this, is you're not trying to make money. You're trying to put out this fire. You're trying to put out that fire. You're trying to get this sale. You're trying to do that. You're trying, but you're not really trying to make money. How do you make money? You make money by knowing your numbers. Profit and running a business is a math problem. You have your uh, uh, your revenue that comes in. Uh, you have the cost of goods sold that comes out of that. And that's a certain percentage that gives you your gross profit. And then you have your overhead. And then below that, after you take those two things out, you have your profit. So if you're not monitoring your gross profit percentage and your overhead percentages on at least a weekly basis, you're not trying to make money. You're trying to do a lot of other things but you're not trying to make money. It is so important to have a properly designed variable budget for your business that you are reviewing weekly in your financial meeting 
so you can have the focus on making money. Because no matter what you put down for your goals, you are a for-profit business. And that means you have to make a profit. And if you are, you are responsible for that bottom line. That's what your job is. We will complain about employees not doing their jobs. Well, your job is to hold two numbers. It's to hold your gross profit percentage at a, a predetermined level, and it's to hold your overhead to a predetermined level, and then drive sales. If you're not doing those things, you are not doing your job, so don't complain about your employees doing theirs, not doing theirs. I believe in you because you're good at this, and I believe that if you were trying to run a business instead of trying to own a job, you would be making more money, and it would be uh, you would find all of a sudden that you have a lot more time and a lot of the things that you have on your goals and the same reasons you're trying to do this can be accomplished. Step five, know your enemy. Your enemy is complacency. Your enemy is the complacency that results from your comfort zone. From, okay, things are okay, so we'll just keep on doing things the way they were. Uh, if you every day you are either getting better or you are getting worse you can never stay the same and so if you don't improve tomorrow you're going to be a little worse than you were yesterday and that means creating urgency create urgency within the company every good growing business that I have ever been in and I've been in nearly 4,000 small businesses has someone I call a pot stirrer. They like to stir the pot. Going back to an old time baseball analogy, uh, the Billy Martin, George Steinbrenner, they stirred the pot. They always kept people going one way or another and, and they, there was never complacency that set in and no one can argue with the success that the Yankees used to have. You need that sense of urgency. You, and how is that created? It's created through goals, budgets, and focus. It's created through weekly meetings of holding people accountable to numbers and uh, holding yourself accountable to results. It, the focus can be assisted significantly by a third party like our success partners. You need someone that can look at you and not kiss up to you and can tell you what you need to hear. No, you didn't accomplish that this week. How are we going to do it? Um, a way I liked to run meetings was, uh, for example, uh, your financial meeting, You maybe you would have on, on Monday morning at seven o'clock. You'd have someone responsible for your uh, cost of goods sold percentage and someone responsible for your overhead percentage. On Friday at the end of the day, they had to write on a sheet of paper what the percentage was that week which means, of course, they had to have some information. Okay, well, we got it for them. And as long as they were above or at their goal, they didn't have to show up for the seven o'clock Monday morning meeting. If they were below their goal, they had to show up for the meeting and they had to answer just some very, very simple questions. Number one, why didn't you hit your goal? Number two, what are you going to do this week to change it? That creates some urgency, and it also pushes the problem onto them, which is where it belongs, not onto you. Let them worry all weekend and ruin their weekend about what they're going to tell you on Monday morning instead of you trying to figure it out all weekend whether they made it or not. So you create that urgency that's there, and you make them tell you how they are going to change it. Now, when they, when they come back with a response, if you ask them why they didn't accomplish it, as soon as their lips move, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to give you an excuse or they're going to give you a reason. Now it's up to you to decide whether it was an excuse or a reason. For example, you got a 16 year old kid supposed to be in with the car at 10 o'clock, comes in at 10:10. Okay, why aren't you here? 
as soon as their lips move, one of two things. You've got an excuse or you've got a reason. The, the reason could be, oh, there was a, uh, a tornado and uh, the road was closed and I had to help this old lady get back to her house and blah, 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 and so I ended up coming back in 10 minutes late. You know what, that's a reason and I'll, I'll accept that. But more than likely, they're going to give you an excuse. The difference between a reason and an excuse for not accomplishing something is the excuse isn't true. They could have done it, but they've chosen not to, and that's how it has to be approached. So your success is going to be determined by the excuses that you're willing to accept, and you can't allow complacency in your comfort zone to allow you to stay the same and your company not to achieve its goals and you not to get the success that you deserve. Step six, overcome your ego. And yes, you have one. Every good business owner has an ego. You have to have an ego. There's nothing wrong with that. Ego is part of what drives you and it's fine. But you need to understand uh, that you do have that ego. And you may fall into one of a couple categories that we have for business owners. One is what we call the self-fixer. They think they can fix anything, do anything themselves. Okay, uh, you give them a little direction and oh, okay, well, well, I can just do that myself. Okay, and all of a sudden they become an expert at taxes, they become an expert on uh, uh, employment, they become an expert on every technical aspect within their business and uh, they never need any help. Uh, they, they can just fix everything themselves. Wrong. That's a management system. That's working within your business. That is not making the best use of your time. That is not where you want to go. The second type of person you might be is what we call the artist. The artist uh, is, uh, doesn't understand the balance between his desire for the of uh, producing the perfect uh, uh, product and the perfect uh, painting or whatever you want to call it. And uh, they will spend all sorts of time to get that last broke in there just perfectly uh, with really no uh, concern uh, with what it costs them to do it. They're not trying to make money. They're not running a business. Instead, uh, they're simply an artist and they don't have that focus. The value of a guide, our success partners are guides. The value of that guide is the focus that they create. What is the focus that, that they can do? Each week you have a meeting with them. They can hold you accountable. They can give you projects. They can lay things off. They can back off sometimes. They can push you. They can review things. And they can also implement and, and install systems, procedures, and controls that you wouldn't have done and create focus, focus, focus. The greatest value in working with someone else is the focus that it creates. They aren't going to change your business. They don't understand your product and your, your, your people and things as well as you do. They can't, no one can, but they can create focus and they can hold people accountable and they can give you the tools so that you can do it yourself. Somewhere between the self fixer and the artist is the true business owner who's really making money, and they're doing so because they got some help. Step seven, let's grasp the potential of the business you already have. What is the true potential of your business? Remember, as I just mentioned, your success is going to be limited to the excuses that you are willing to accept. One of the, and you will offer excuses to yourself as to why you can't grow and why you can't make more money and all those sorts of things and they aren't true. And your success is going to be limited to the excuses that you're willing to accept. Occasionally there can be a reason but that should be the occasional blip in the screen that causes you to restructure and regroup and move forward again in a different direction. For example, start with your market share. I don't know what you're doing. Obviously, we're dealing with uh, hundreds of people here that are all doing different things. But uh, I would guess that in most cases, the market share, let's say you're an electrician, uh, your market share of all the electrical work in your, your area is a blip on the screen. You're nowhere near 
a 50 or 70 percent market share. You might be. Okay, now you might be, and that can be something else. We can talk about that. But more than likely, you could double your market share and still be a blip on the screen. So don't say you can't grow. Of course you can grow. You might be taking work from someone else. That's okay. They're very willing to take it from you. We do a self-assessment exercise. You can find it on our website at www.tfginfo.org. And we are going to, at the conclusion of this, encourage you to do this self-assessment exercise. There you will identify areas of management uh, that are contributing to lost potential. And it'll also identify what the actual potential is uh, of your business. You'll find out how much you're actually leaving on the table and you'll be surprised that it's significant. But you can start with just a real quick off the top of your head. If you're making about 4% and you think you should make 8%, what's 4% of your, that means you're leaving 4% of your entire sales volume uh, on the table. And you might think of what you could do with that kind of money. Now, as we also said, you have to have growth. And through the help of a, of a success partner, you can uh, identify which type of growth is most applicable at this time. Coming out of the year that we've just had, for most everyone, what their real need is to grow themselves through sales, sell themselves to the next level. Once you have accomplished an increased sales level, your next task is to earn yourself to the next level. In other words, let's say you're doing uh, numbers out of the sky here, a uh, million dollars a year, but you have to do your break evens a million and a half. Okay, so the first thing we got to do is we got to get you to two million dollars in sales and let's get you there. So you get up to two millions in sales, then we start looking at, okay, how can we increase our margins on that two million dollars of sales? So you can, you can sell yourself to sue your next level or you can earn yourself out of it. Um, earning yourself out of it, into it, I guess would be a better way to put it, um, uh, are where the constraints of your management system starts coming in. Your management system can put a tremendous restraint on whether or not you're able to earn yourself into the next level. That's where we get involved in much more of the technical types of consulting. As far as selling yourself onto the next level, um, we currently with our clients have a, uh, a think big challenge going on where we're challenging them to write out the different ways that uh, just theoretically, you know, no, not holding, not holding you accountable for it or anything, but theoretically, uh, how could you double your sales next year? What, what, where would they come from? What would have to be done? And just brainstorm and lay it all out. And then we work past that as to, okay, well, what would you have to do in the way of, uh, uh, in, of uh, financial investment, uh, assets, uh, people, uh, whatever, um, uh, to accomplish each one of those? And what's the real likelihood of each one of them happening? And which ones are the most likely? And then we, we can start focusing that with our, our sales system. So think big challenge and uh, the constraints of your marketing system are both the things that are going to uh, restrain your growth and it's only going to be restrained if you believe it can be restrained. You can, your, your, your company was going to be a blip on the big screen in, of, of the industry anyway. You might as well be twice as big. Step eight, know the value of your time. What are you really worth? Are you in, if you're only doing a job in your business, if you're doing the accounting, if you're doing the management of this, if you're stocking this stores or you're out there pounding nail, whatever it is, you're only going to earn what the wages are of that particular task. You don't own a business if you are only doing the job. Owning a business, there is no limit on how much you can earn. So here's the test. Take what you're doing right now and replace yourself with a general manager or whatever uh, category you want to call it. Uh, and then say, how much would we have to pay them to come in? And uh, what would be the comp uh, a compatible wage uh, for those, those uh, uh, functions? Okay. Question one, are you even earning that much yourself? You better be because you are also taking the entire financial risk of your business. If your business goes under, you lose your house. 
your employees go across the street and get a new job and probably get a raise. So you had better be earning more than just what you would pay somebody to do your job. If you aren't, we really need to talk. Second test, your compensation for the profit in your business should be significantly greater than the compensation for that general manager or whatever that you were going to hire to replace the functions that you're doing. If you're not earning more money from the profit of your business than you are from doing the jobs in your business, you don't own a business. You simply own a job. And if that's all you want, I, I'm disappointed that you've got this far in the webinar because you really aren't going to benefit from it. What is it that you really want? How much time is really does it take to run a small business? You'll be stunned when I tell you this. Okay. First of all, let's think about your business. And again, I'm pulling numbers out of the sky. You apply your own numbers. You're probably working 40 hours a week right now. Maybe more, maybe 60 hours a week. And your volume is X. Well, you know what? There are, think about it, look around. In your own industry, there are people doing 10 times the amount of volume that you are. Does that mean they're working 400 or 600 hours a week? I kind of doubt it. What they've done is they've understood a management system. And what their job is, is to run the business. You really can run a, effectively a small business on about eight hours a week. You need to have a sales meeting, you need to have an operational meeting, you have a financial meeting. You have to have all three of those. You have to be able to troubleshoot some of the things that come out of it and delegate things out. And the rest of your time should be spent strategizing and communicating and implementing the changes that you've strategized. You create the system that is producing the cash flow and the profit, not the people. You have a create a functional budget so that your financial meetings actually mean something. I will walk into your business right now and I will make a wager that if I ask you, how do you use your budget? You will hem and you will haw. And when I tie you down, you will finally tell me, oh, we don't really have a budget. Let me get this straight. If you don't have a functional budget, how you don't have a roadmap to your profitability. That's what it is. A budget is not, oh, I can't go out to lunch this week because, uh, uh, you know, I'm on a budget. No. A budget is a financial plan designed to produce a predetermined desirable result. Do you have it? And how is it, is it variable based upon percentages so that you, can, you know, as your sales change, your numbers are changing constantly so that you can constantly manage the, it's very easy to add stuff when you're growing, but where businesses fail is they can't get, they don't get rid of things fast enough when things are going down. So you need to have a system and in particularly a financial control system, and you need to learn to trust that system. Spend your hours working on the business, not in the business. I wasn't the one that made up that line. Step nine, we're getting there. The necessity of an operations manual. Most of you know that you're supposed to have an employee manual. An employee manual goes through uh, uh, your vacation pay and your responsibilities and all the sexual harassment and all the different things your lawyers say. You have to put in an in a employee manual to make sure that you're covered. Frankly, you're better off uh, not having one than having one that's not up to date and taken care of, but that's a whole other issue. But an employee manual is not an operations manual. The operations manual is your business Bible. It is how this business works. It's put together well enough so that uh, if you left, someone could pick it up and say, oh, this is how we run Acme. 
Oh, we do it like this. This is done. Here's how this person does this. This is how this person does that. Here's how meetings we have. Here's how we do this. Why do you need to an operations manual? Why do you need to put all of that in writing? You know it all. It's in your head, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. We know how we do our budget. We just keep it in our head. I know how it should be. I can usually tell how much money's in the bank. I know where we're going. Ah, no, no. If it's not in writing, you're not committed to it. Large parts of your success partner's responsibility is to hold you accountable and create focus. You're real big on holding employees accountable. We need to hold yourself accountable for doing your job. And if it isn't in writing, you're not committed to it because you can always say, ah, I didn't quite mean that. That's not quite what I meant. You put together the operations manual. It's a, it's a living document where you constantly update it. Uh, it includes all everything that one would have to know as to how your business is run. We provide a whole template in that, and then over time, it's a journey, by the way, it's not a destination. Uh, we, we fill in the different sections, you get the different things there, and the more it's there, the better it works out. What kind of functions does the uh, op operations manual have? It's really three things. It creates focus. It create, makes you focus on how you do things. It allows for delegation, because now you can clearly tell someone else how they're supposed to do their tasks within it. And then it documents your systems, which minimizes your risk and allows for growth. It's much easier and less risky to run a large business than it is a small business. I hear the excuse, oh, I can't grow because it's too risky. No, no, no. You can't grow because your management system has put a management cap, uh, a sales cap on the amount of volume that you can effectively uh, process. Uh, we have to change the way you do that. You could grow. You're choosing not to. It's not true. That's an excuse. And the reason is your management system. But uh, if you don't document it, you, know, you're, you're, you, you don't have a management system. It, who's going to go out of business? The billion dollar company or the uh, $100,000 company? Which one's more likely to go out of business? One bad mistake by a small business and you're toast. One bad mistake by uh, a million dollar mistake by a billion dollar business and eh, you know we'll fire somebody and we'll move on. Uh, it's much riskier to be small. So don't think small, think big. And that means you have to build an operations manual, almost like, the, uh, well, one of the reasons why franchises are generally uh, more successful is because they have operations manuals. Everything is put in writing. This is how you do everything. And you have a system and you can focus on that system. So let's do it. Step 10, managerial information and the managerial function. Wow. Um, in other words, are you running the business by numbers or are you running it by gut feel? You're probably running it by gut feel. And you know, most of your guys' guts are pretty darn good. They really are. But if you make a one or 2% mistake and you start growing, uh, that can be a lot of money. And that can be the difference between your success and not having your success. So what do we need? Uh, you need to understand the need for managerial accounting and management by numbers. Very, very few of the businesses I've gone into um, really have effective managerial accounting. They'll all have good tax accounting. Now, what's the difference? Okay, there's a story I like to tell. It's, uh, it's just an analogy. And it's, you may like it, you may not, but imagine you looked out the window of your business onto the road and right along the sidewalk, maybe on your property, maybe not, um, there's a little boy walking there and there's a car that comes along and it's turning, probably coming into your business and it hits this little boy and it's a terrible tragedy that you've just witnessed. Now, after you've witnessed this terrible tragedy, you've got to write three letters. One letter you write to your lawyer describing what you saw. You have to be honest in all three of your letters. Second letter, you write to your best friend to describe what you saw. And then your third letter, you're writing to your eight-year-old niece to describe what you just saw. Obviously, those letters are all going to be very different. And if your eight-year-old niece got the letter 
if it was intended for your lawyer, she wouldn't understand it, be very confused, and maybe very upset. Your accounting also has to write three letters. The one letter that most of you are fairly good at is your tax letter. You keep track of everything to the penny, you lay stuff out, you put it together so that you can file your income tax properly. That's your tax accounting. And you know what? That's got to be done to the dime. It's got to be correct. It's got to, you can take whatever time it takes to fill it out and make sure it's done right. It's got to be done right. But managerial accounting isn't quite the same. Managerial accounting is the information that you need to know to run your business by. What do you need to know to run your business? Well, you need to know half a dozen what key profit indicators. Um, one is what were your sales? Or, uh, number two, what's your cost of goods percentage? Number three, uh, uh, what's uh, your overhead percentage? Uh, number four, uh, how much cash do we have in the bank? Um, number five, how much are we going to have in future weeks uh, in the bank? Uh, uh, how much, uh, uh, there's other variables that are critical in your business uh, that you want to review and see every week. And so you need to have a report on those every week. That report has to come from the person who's responsible for it to you. And as we said before, then you have a meeting, a financial meeting, where you hold them accountable. And they don't have to. If, it's, if the numbers are right, that's fine. But if they're not, they have to be there. But these reports don't have to be the same as your um, tax accounting. All they need to do is meet four criteria. They've got to be timely. They've got to be accurate. They've got to be usable. And they've got to be produced at a minimum cost. What does timely mean? It means you've got to get it immediately in time for you to act upon it. If you're only looking at your month end uh, profit and loss statement, you'll see, oh my gosh, this number is way out of whack. What are we going to do about it? Well, that's been going on for a month. And that's looking backwards. You have to look forwards, okay? And it has to be immediate. And how are we going to change it next week so that we don't get that number at the end of the month? Accuracy, the second uh, component, is um, not the same as the accuracy that's required in your tax accounting. It's got to be close enough to look for trends. It doesn't have to be perfect and balanced to the dime. If it's not if it's not completely right, that's probably okay. You'll catch it the next week when it fills in and, and it's all right. But a reasonable amount of accuracy, not, not a infallible amount of accuracy. It's got to be a usable report. I have seen accountants give a month-end statement to owners that are two inches thick and I always, when I see that, I think, you know what, that accountant's probably hiding something about an inch and a half down into there. Um, no, put it in a format that's just, that it's usable. It can be a text for crying out loud. It can be a, a, a something written down on a sheet of paper and left on the desk. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it can be a graph. It can be a chart. It can be done in crayon if that's what you want. It doesn't matter as long as it's usable. And it needs to be produced at a minimum cost. You don't want to bring a bunch of people in to create reports that are going to save you $100 uh, but cost you $1,000 to do. That's absurd, obviously. So they have to be produced at a minimum cost. All your reports have to be timely, accurate, usable, and produced at a minimum cost. Very few this small business owners are getting the numbers that they need to have. That's why the Fremont Group started up our own accounting division, where we take over your, your daily accounting. You spend half the price on it that you were spending. We coordinate with your person there. You usually don't fire the person that's there uh, because uh, uh, there are other valuable things they could be doing within the company that can't really be done remotely. But you restructure their job. We take over the accounting significantly less. And then what do you have? You have better value for it because it's there. You have continuity of it. You don't have to worry if the person goes on vacation, if they quit, if uh, uh, whatever happens. Uh, the continuity is always there. And you have coordination uh, with your uh, the consulting and the uh, uh, systems procedures and uh, uh, reports that are being generated uh, through your uh, success partner. And that gives you the information that you need for your operations, or excuse me, your financial meetings each week. You should be able to get that from there. 
if you don't have a, at least a six week cash flow forecast that says here's where we stand in cash at the end of this week and next week and the next week for the next six weeks, if you don't have a variable budget that is being constantly reviewed and uh, uh, tied back uh, together with uh, your actual results in, in a weekly meeting and you're not and it's not tying back to an operational meeting uh, for your people responsible for those you really don't have effective managerial functions your success partner can get you that and that then you can start really running the business to trying to make money instead of just trying to do whatever it is you try to do every day when you come in. Throughout your life as an owner or work with a success partner, there's a hierarchy of learning that you will go through. And the KPIs and the, the managerial accounting lends itself to tossing this in at this particular point. At the bottom of the, tr of the uh, pyramid is data. You need there's data all around you. Um, what sales were done? What were the sales volume for this? Who did that? Who did this? Well, how much is that? Where did this come from? What did this cost? What did we spend on that? Data is everywhere. You then take that data and convert it into information, which are the reports that you get. The computers that they have now, a good QuickBooks or anything else, uh, is very effective at converting data into information. And you can, there isn't a software program out there right now that can't create 50 more reports than you will ever need. There is, by the way, one software that's better for your business than any other software. I highly recommend this one software. It's the, by far the best one that you should have for your business. And that is the software that the people running it know and understand and like. Because they can all do 50 times more than you really need. Okay, And so if they understand it and like it, they'll use it and it'll be there. And you'll get all the reports that you need. What's the third step? The third step is knowledge. Knowledge is where... Um, Certainly, well, it's where we spend a lot of our time working with business owners, and that is which reports and what information are really important. Which ones do I need and which ones do I not really need? Where should I be looking at what and how often should I be looking at it and why? That's the knowledge that is the third step. The fourth step is thought. A guide can help here to some degree, but uh, uh, and, and certainly the focus and, and can contribute more to your knowledge. But uh, the question in knowledge is, or excuse me, in thought is, what can I do that would change the results? What could I do so that these reports come back differently? That's the thought process. And then lastly, through the repetition of those steps, you flip up to the fifth step, which is wisdom. It's the repetition of that process of taking data, creating reports, knowing which ones are important, thinking about what changes and what could be done that uh, will change the data so you get the results and the reports that you're looking for, and what works and what doesn't work. The fact of the matter is uh, man plans and God laughs. You aren't always going to be right. Sometimes uh, you're going to be wrong, but you have to keep trying. You have to keep changing things. The thought has to keep coming in to try and get different results. Uh, the uh, fact of the matter is that this is really what your function is. This leads to continuous systems improvement. Now, the fact, no, there's another fact of the matter, uh, and that is uh, I'm never going to play golf as well as Tiger Woods. He's got more talent than I do. But that doesn't mean that I can't enjoy it and play it to the, my maximum level. And it's going to be the same thing with you. There are going to be people who are going to be better at it than you are. That's okay. It's okay. You get, but if you have an effective system and you work that system and you're getting the maximum out of it, you're going to be way ahead of those people anyway. Some people will be better than you. That's okay. But if you follow the system, you will get the success that you're trying to get. Step 11, communicate and delegate. Let's start with communicate. 
We've already talked about this to some degree. Part of your subsystems of your management system is a communications plan. How are you going to communicate to your employees? What are you going to communicate to them? When are you going to communicate them? And, and why are you going to communicate it to them? Uh, everyone uh, needs to have some information. They need to have the uh, uh, warm fuzzy that you know where you're growing and you're taking them in the right direction. The company's going to grow and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they need to know what they're responsible for for the upcoming week, and they need to know what they've got to do each day. And so having starting with uh, uh, those three things is a good place to start your uh, communications plan. And uh, uh, as, as we said before, you really need to have three levels. Maybe you have a biannual company event where you uh, give them a little talk about where you're going, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you have a monthly meeting uh, that uh, kind of says this is what we're trying to accomplish this month or this week or however you decide to do it. Um, you know, this is where we stand and create some focus. And then you need to have the daily huddle. You don't have to do the daily huddle. The managers of people or themselves, they can do it the daily huddle. But each daily huddle needs to have a focus point that you are using as your steering wheel to try to create focus to move the company to accomplish the different things to, uh, within your KPIs to accomplish your success and stay within your budget. So that, that's, that's kind of the communications plan that's needed. But uh, it also ties together employees need to know what it is, what result they are responsible for. Notice how I said that, what result they are responsible for. So many people try to write out job descriptions, and this is a way of communicating what they're responsible for to employees, is through a job description. They write out a job description that really is just a list of tasks. Here's the 14 things you do. Do this, one, two, three, four, 14. These are the things that you're supposed to do. So then at the end of the month or the end of the week, you haul them in because they didn't do five of them, and they say, well, gee, I didn't have time. I had to do the other nine. Uh, and you don't have a whole lot of answers. So instead of making your job descriptions a list of tasks, you have to put a measurable result that is expected from them. If the results that are expected from them are clearly communicated, then that list of tasks becomes the training manual as to how to accomplish it. And now, if the results that they are expected to be held accountable for are clearly defined, you can hold them accountable. Did they do their job or didn't they do their job? If they didn't do their job, you ask them why. When their lips move, you decide if it's an excuse or a reason. The excuse isn't true and you need to either retrain them or replace them. However, sometimes there are reasons. The job description and the, what's expected of them just wasn't reasonable, didn't work. Some situations have changed, something's different. In that case, we change the job. Their co base compensation is based upon the, the results that they are expected to produce. Incentives have to be tied to accountability, but incentives and accountability are a yin and a yang, and you have to have both or you're going to fail in any kind of an incentive program. You must be able, to, the employee must be able to know and control the result. If they aren't able to do that, uh, you can't hold them accountable for it. And you cannot create an incentive that actually gives them more compensation for just doing their job. The incentive is only for going beyond what they're responsible for providing. So if they're being paid uh, X dollars to produce Y results, if they want to raise, you say, great, produce X plus two, and now I can be paying you Y plus two. Or maybe they don't want to be responsible for that. You create an incentive that if they do produce Y plus two, they get a two. Whatever, I don't know, was my tat, but you get the gist here. You have to have defined what you're paying. You have a contract with every one of your employees, whether you know it or not, and that is every week you give me these results and I'll give you this paycheck. If they don't understand the results that are expected in exchange for their paycheck, you don't have a way of holding them accountable and you don't have any way of creating any incentives for them to do more. So think about that as we go to the second part, which is delegation. 
Stephen Covey has an excellent analysis of effective delegation. Effective delegation requires a communication of their level of authority. Oftentimes we don't think about that, but you have to, when you delegate something to someone, you are delegating them at a certain level of authority. The lowest level of authority is none. They can follow you around and watch. The next level of authority is they can ask questions. Okay, all right, let me listen. What are your questions? Oh, okay. If you like the questions that they're asking, then they can move up to a third level of authority, which is make recommendations. Oh, okay, all right. But you see, you still haven't hurt the company at all because they still haven't been able to really do anything yet. Okay, so this is a fairly low, low, very low level of authority and therefore a very low level of compensation. If you like the recommendations, let them move up one. Then they can act and report immediately on what they did. Act and report immediately. If they're successful there, they can move up to being able to act and report periodically. Okay. And then eventually they can get to that highest level of authority, which is act independently. Now, I have a, uh, uh, it's not really a story, but it's a, an observation and I'll let you decide what you think of it. But I find two different types of owners. And as a very generalization, and I don't like saying this sometimes, but uh, I'll let you decide which one is which. Uh, there's a big difference between, and this is general, it's not everybody, men management and women managers or owners. One type tends to take the kid and throw them in the water and see if they can swim. They talk, talk them in at, and let the person turn out and act independently immediately and then let them fail down to their appropriate level of authority. The second type of person sticks them in at a very low level of authority and never lets them move up. Neither one of those is particularly functional and you can decide uh, where you fall within that yourself. Um, but in my years of observation, I tend that most men tend to be throwing them in and letting them fail down and most women tend never to let them get enough authority. So, uh, but again, that's a generalization. I don't want to get myself in trouble here. Uh, it can work the other way also, but uh, decide if you, which one you're doing. But compensation needs to be tied to the level of authority. And also notice on there, as you move up to those top three levels of authority, there's a very important word report. They have to report what they have done. You don't go find out what they've done. A part of their responsibility is for them to let you know what they have done. They have to do it. It has to come from them. That serves two functions. Number one, it forces them to write down and commit to what they actually did. And number two, uh, it uh, gives you the peace of mind that knowing that the act has actually been completed. That is a really critical management technique in pushing that responsibility to report onto the employee. If you're having trouble delegating, think about these steps and think about how you can move people through them. And remember that they're also fluid. You might have somebody that's been moved all the way up to acting and reporting periodically, but uh, eh, something didn't go right. Let's move down and report immediately or maybe they've moved up to act independently and they've really screwed up and we wanna just drop them all the way down to just, okay, I just wanna hear your recommendations now, uh, whatever. But that also would be a change in compensation because that's a change their value to the business. So always keep in mind the level of authority that you're delegating. Your last step, step 12, enjoy your journey. It's lonely at the top. That's the bottom line. It's lonely in your business. You can have successes, but who tells you, oh, what a great job you did of holding the cost of goods to 41% last month? Nobody talks like that. Nobody celebrates those successes. Nobody ever says, oh, what a great job you did of, of, of increasing sales to this or, or, or uh, raising the profit to this. 
That's just not how it's done. That's one of the real values of identifying goals with your success partner so that your success partner can focus on them with you and celebrate those successes with you. It also has to be tied back to your compensation. You have to be making enough money that you're proud of what it is. You should, you know, the uh, and it should be coming from the profitability of the business, which is producing the profit is what your job is. Um, if you're doing that, again, your success partner can celebrate it with you and can can uh, focus on it and get it done. And you have to have a quality of life. You have to make sure that part of your goals are time family, other things, whatever it is that you have really identified as your success. You have to be able to celebrate those things and you have to remember that it is a journey. It's never a destination. You're not going to just get there and it's going to be over. Celebrate as you go along. Hold yourself accountable to make changes. Create uh, uh, the pot stir so that there's no complacency and, and that there's no comfort zone that's holding you back. And that's how you can accomplish those different things. So you've made it. You've identified the 12 steps towards your success. These steps, just like your business, are a journey. They're not a destination. You're not ever going to get every one of them perfect. It doesn't matter. It isn't going to be there. It's a journey. You just constantly try to improve it and try to get to the next level of each different thing. In golf, they say it's really a simple game. See your target, hit it to the target, chase it, and repeat. And it's the same thing with your business. Let's see your targets. Let's hit to your target. Let's chase it. And then let's repeat it and try to get better. The main takeaways that I hope you've received from this webinar are number one, is to define your success. Define why you're really doing this and what it is you're trying to accomplish. And then get help to keep you focused on how you're going to achieve it, where it's going to come from, uh, what are the steps that can be done, what different systems, procedures, and controls can make a difference, how can you take your business to the next level, how can we deal with people, but it's all done as part of a system that you own that is designed to produce your success. If you're just working a job, again, you don't belong with us, you're, you belong, frankly, working for somebody else. You don't belong owning a business because you don't. Let's get you to own a business. Let's take you up to that next level. That's what we try to do. The Fremont Group is a nonprofit organization designed to work with small business owners to help you accomplish your success. Our success partners have been there and done that. You can benefit from the focus that they can provide. We provide exploratory consultations. If you look on our website at www.tfginfo.org, you can sign up for an exploratory consultation. That's a half hour with us where we get to know you, you get to understand us a little bit, and we do a, a basic consultation uh, as to where you could go. We do business assessments, assessments which is typically a two-day exercise, uh, possibly on-site, although we're doing almost all of them by Zoom now. Almost all our work is done by Zoom now. Uh, in the business assessment, we go through every aspect of your business and we develop an action plan as to what it's going to take you to get to where you want to go. And then we have continuously weekly support through clients' consultations done by Zoom. Every week you schedule a, a half hour meeting with us and uh, we, we listen and we hold you accountable and we provide exercises and we, we uh, see where you've been and, and, and uh, give you that third party extra pair of eyes constantly on your business for a nominal amount. There's also a huge amount of webinars, uh, blog material, articles and so on on our Patreon site um, and our focus is on your success, not on ours. As a thank you gift for having been here for the last hour and 20 minutes, um, you're going to receive a copy of Minding My Own Business. I'm the author of that book. You'll see in it the six responsibilities of the small business owner and much of it tied back into to the, uh, the 12 steps that you've just reviewed. So here's what you do to get your free copy. Number one, go to www.tfginfo.org. That's our website. You will see on there um, 
the self-assessment. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Download it and complete it. That'll take you at least 15 minutes. It goes through a number of thought-provoking questions about how you're managing your business and what you're doing. Email the file back to us and then go back on our website at the bottom of the home page and schedule an exploratory consultation. Uh, you'll get a uh, time then for a Zoom and uh, a success partner will go through the uh, uh, self-assessment that you've done, will identify uh, what's being left on the table, where your strengths and weaknesses are, and what are the areas which you're most likely to change to uh, um, be able to uh, uh, accomplish the goals and, take, and get the money that's being left on the table. And then lastly, as long as you're there, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to our newsletter also. It's free also. Again, thank you. Um, through your business, uh, you have created an opportunity for yourself for a lifestyle way above the average person. But all you have is an opportunity. Through no fault of your own, the world is changing. Every day, you either get better or you get worse. You can't stay the same. The success, part success partners of TFG have experience and expertise. We understand that our role is to give you the tools and the focus that allow you to achieve your success. So, you want to be a hero? Let's talk. Give us a call, 303-338-9300. We hope to hear from you, and we'll be looking for your self-assessment uh, and your uh, uh, exploratory consultation uh, so we can send you out a copy of Minding My Own Business. Again, thank you for your time. My name is Dirk Dieters. I'm the founder and executive director of the Fremont Group, and we look forward to working with you. Have a great day, and let's go make some money.